God is the God of fresh starts and new beginnings and second chances. God is the God of glory days. And if you're in need of some glory days, then welcome to this study of the life and the book of Joshua. God gave Joshua and the Hebrews a second chance at the promised land, and they took it. And if you're ready to enter your promised land, then this story and this study is for you. We're going to make our Glory Days declaration. The words are going to appear on the screen. I invite you to fill your lungs with air and what? Your hearts with hope. Say it like you mean it. Here we go. These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true. His word is sure. With God as my helper. Have mercy now, Lord, upon the speaker. You know his sins are many. Grant that we could see Christ and just Christ. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Joy Verone was all alone in her hotel room. She had no feeling in her legs or mobility in her lower body. Her spine had been snapped when she saved the lives of her three children. The family SUV had slipped out of gear and careened toward the edge of a steep Colorado mountain ravine. She ran and placed herself in front of the automobile, slowing it down enough for her father to open the door and press the brakes. That was October of 1999, and her children can still remember the expression on the face of their mother as the car pulled her under. Her children were saved, but Joy's back was broken and the internal damage was severe. Emergency rescue airlifted Joy to a hospital in Farmington, New Mexico. Her condition was so fragile that the doctors worked for 12 days just to stabilize her before surgery. She emerged from the operation with a dangerously high fever. Her medical team struggled to get the fever under control. For seven days, the temperature raged. And while the temperature raged, so did her fears. Her doctors tried to comfort her, but there was no comfort to be had. She feared living, then she feared dying. Joy pleaded with her mom for help. Her mom had been maintaining a bedside vigil. And at one point, her mom said, I'm going to go call some friends to pray. And she said, I'll be right back. And so she stepped out of the room. So Joy was all alone in her hospital room, but not for long. A man appeared. He opened the door and walked in. Joy did not recognize him. For her request, all of her nurses were females. If this man was a doctor, he was not one of her doctors. He had a striking appearance, a tall man with high cheekbones. He was dressed in white. He had silver hair that was parted in the middle and ran right down the middle of his back in a ponytail. And his eyes, those eyes so striking that 14 years later when Joy described them to me, her face lit up. They were crystal blue, she said, and bright. I've never seen such beautiful eyes. The visitor stepped toward her bed and he lifted her chart and he casually flipped through the pages, though Joy had the distinct impression that he was not reading anything. After a few moments, he spoke to her with a smoothing, a soothing voice. And he said, Joy, you are going to be all right. You will get through this. He looked at her, and then just as quickly as he had entered, he left. Joy instantly believed him. She said, had the doctor, a nurse, or a family member said those words, I would have doubted them. But when this stranger spoke, there was a knowing in my inner person. 
He knew me and I believed him and I knew I was going to be okay. When her mom re-entered the room, Joy immediately told her about the man. Mom, the man told me that everything is going to be fine. Well, Joy's mom ran out into the hall to find the visitor, but he was nowhere to be seen. She described him to the hospital staff. They had never seen such a man. They searched the hospital. No one could find him. And Joy believes she knows why. She believes that the visitor wasn't from earth, that he was a guest from heaven. That visit was a turning point for Joy. The years have brought pain and difficulty and a life in a wheelchair. But she often turns to the memory of that blue-eyed guest for some strength. He told her, you're going to be all right. You're going to get through this. And she has. Who was this visitor? From where did he come? And dare we believe what joy believes? That an emissary from heaven was sent her way. Joshua would like to weigh in on this discussion. He has a testimony of his own. He was facing a challenge every bit as daunting. If you like to fill in the blanks, here's your first one. Let's talk about the challenge, the challenge, <clears throat> the story. In Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1 begins with this phrase, Joshua was near Jericho, Jericho. The ancient city of Jericho, it sat five miles north of the Dead Sea and six miles west of the Jordan River. The ruins of this city cover some 13 acres. Successive walls encircled the stone houses, and the outer wall was seven feet wide and 16 feet high. On top of this wall, a second wall was built, this one eight feet tall. A citadel guarded the north end. A thick forest of palm trees, eight miles long and three miles wide, stood immediately east of the city. Steep hills protected the western wall. It was elevated. It had high walls. It had protected sides. It must have been an imposing sight to Joshua. Not a difficult thing to imagine the commander's concerns as he looked toward the fortress. Here he was. Apparently, he was all alone. There's no reference to anyone else. Why was he here? Joshua was near Jericho. He had left the encampment at Gilgal and traveled alone to Joshua. Why? To gather intel? I can't help but think it was to gather something else, to gather his courage. He had never faced such a challenge. He and his men had fought battles in the wilderness, always on their terms and on their turf. But they had never gone against a fortified city. They had never passed this way before, and you haven't either. You're facing a Jericho unlike any you've ever faced. You're facing a challenge that looms out of the horizon and blocks your view of your future. It's big. It's imposing. It's a fortress. It's a stronghold, and it stands between you in your glory days, it stands between you and the promised land. You can't move forward without facing it. Like Joshua, you sure can see it. And like Joshua, you must face it. But like Joshua, you don't have to face your Jericho all alone. Look at the appearance. The appearance. What a story. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, <clears throat> Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. 
You know, the Bible's famous for its surprise encounters, isn't it? Abram and the angelic guests who visited him. Moses in the burning bush. Mary and the angels. The disciples on their way to Emmaus and the stranger who appeared to walk with them. The Bible seems full of these stories of unusual experiences and strange encounters. But no visit is more mysterious than this one. The man with the upraised sword and the confident air. Who was this man? And why was he appearing to Joshua near Jericho? Well, let's eliminate some options, shall we? He wasn't an apparition. He wasn't a vision. He wasn't a spirit, a ghost, or a dream. There's nothing in the language that would lead us to believe that the person was anything less than flesh and bone. I mean, he had muscles. He could hold up a sword. He had vocal cords. He could vocalize a voice. He wasn't a figment of Joshua's imagination. Nor was he an angel, though we're awfully tempted to think he was, aren't we? Angels hold up swords. Angels can take on fleshly form. But here's the difference. Angels do not accept worship. We know this because of passages like in the book of Revelation. When John, the apostle, attempted to worship an angel, and the angel said to him, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Angels do not accept worship. Well, this person accepted worship. He not only accepted it, he encouraged it. He told Joshua to remove his sandals. He was standing on holy ground. Maybe this was just a human being, a big, strong fellow. Well, if so, Joshua sure needed some new glasses, because everything about him made, makes us believe that Joshua thought this was someone special. He fell at the man's feet. He removed his sandals out of respect. No, this wasn't a mere mortal. This wasn't an apparition. It wasn't an angel. It really leaves only one option. This was God incarnate. This was Jesus Christ. What Jesus did in Bethlehem for us, Jesus did near Jericho for Joshua. He became flesh. And for a moment, for a time, was in the presence of Joshua. The commander spoke to the commander. Do you find this to be an odd thought? Are you thinking, Lakato, what were you smoking when you studied this week? <laughs> Jesus, B.C.? Does that work? Let me challenge you to stretch your imagination and remember that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was chosen before the creation of the world. So the normal restrictions of time and place and physics do not apply to our king. I think we would be wrong to limit his corporal ministry, his incarnate ministry to 33 years in Palestine. Long before Jesus ate with Zacchaeus in Jericho, Jesus appeared to Joshua near Jericho. And what a moment it was. He said, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. You see, the human eye saw two armies, the Canaanites and the Israelites. But in actuality, there was a third army, the army of the Lord, the angels. This is the heavenly host referred to in Psalms 103, 19 through 21. Bless the Lord, you mighty angels of his who carry out his orders, listening for each of his commands. Yes, bless the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him constantly. Angels. You like to think about angels. Two words describe angels as portrayed in the Bible. Many and mighty. Many and mighty. 
They are mighty. Don't think of those little toy angels you see in gift stores, those little cherubs that fit on a desk or hang from a rearview mirror with chiffon wings and rosy cheeks. God's angels are mighty. They're strong enough to close the mouths of lions. According to the book of Revelation, it will take only one angel to bind up the devil, the fallen angel, and cast him into the bottomless pit. Just one angel can destroy the devil. Imagine what thousands can do. And there are that many. Hebrews 12, 22 refers to thousands of angels in joyful assembly. When John was given a glimpse into the heavens, I suppose he tried to count the angels. Here's what he wrote. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. <laughs> That's like saying, I don't know how many. There are a lot of them. Enough to fill Angel Stadium several times. When God opened the eyes of Elisha's servant, the young man saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Mighty and many angels, mighty in power, many in number, and Jesus, the commander of them all. The message to Joshua is simply this. Joshua, Jericho may have its walls, but you have more. You have the armies of God, and they have come to fight for you. Don't you think that's what Joshua needed? He needed the reminder that he was not alone and that God was with him and that God would stay with him. And that's the reminder we all need when we're afraid, that God is with us. When my daughters were small, they would occasionally be awakened in the middle of the night by some noise. Maybe a branch because of the wind would bump up against the wind or there would be some car out in the street. and They would wake up and they would cry out just down the hallway. They'd cry out. I could hear them, Daddy, Daddy. And when they did, when I woke up, I did what every daddy does. I woke up their mother and No, I went down the hall and I, I walked in, I would walk into their room and, and I noticed that just by walking into their room, the atmosphere changed. They felt better. Before I even said a word, just something about the presence of the Father calmed them. Joshua just needed the presence of his Father. There's no solution to the problem. At the end of this story, Jericho's still standing. Joshua still has his challenges. But there was something about God's presence just reminding Joshua that Joshua did not have to face this Jericho alone. The message that God gave joy in New Mexico, the message that God gave Joshua near Jericho, is the message he gives you today. This is the promise. He's with you. He's still the commander of hosts. He's still in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything. He still sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And he needs only to lift a finger. And thousands upon thousands of angels will respond to his call. He will come to you in the form of a hospital caregiver in the form of a friend, in the form of a phone call, in the form of a dream, I do not know. He may even come to you in the form of a sermon like this one. But he will come to you because he cares about you. And he is for you. This is the message from the dialogue, this curious dialogue between Joshua and the commander, Joshua asked him, are you for us or for our adversaries? What a great question. But then this curious reply, neither. 
See, God doesn't take sides. He does not take sides. He is never against his people. He's never against anyone. Even these hard-hearted Canaanites who had long since turned to worshiping idols and, yes, sacrificing babies in worship. God was not against them. They had turned against him. But had they chosen this day to turn as Rahab did and return to God, he would have received them just as he received Rahab. He wasn't against them. He's not against you. He's for you. And if God is for us, who can be against us? So here you are facing a Jericho level challenge. You're facing walls that are too high for you to climb, you're facing walls that are too thick for you to break. And as you look into your future, it seems like all you can see is that diagnosis or that change or that difficulty or that broken heart or that, dif or that, or that discouragement. And you don't know what to do. Joshua sure can help us here. Here's what he did, and I encourage you to do the same. Look up. Don't stare at Jericho. Look at the story. When Joshua was by Jericho, what did he do? He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him. When did Joshua see Jesus? When Joshua lifted up his eyes. As long as our eyes are on Jericho, we will not see Jesus. We must shift our focus. We must lift up our eyes. I lift up my eyes to the hills, the psalmist said. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Bible's full of stories of people who did this. One of my favorite is the story of Paul and Silas in the New Testament, in the book of Acts. These were two missionaries who had been imprisoned in the town of Philippi in a Roman prison, they had been placed down in the bowels of the prison, in the innermost part of the prison. They had no recourse, no means of escape. But rather than look at their prison cell, they looked to God. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Midnight, that's the darkest hour. And they were in the darkest place, in the deepest hole of the jail. The doors were locked. The guards were on duty. Yet what were Paul and Silas doing? Singing and praying, lifting up their eyes, looking to God. Like Joshua, they received help dramatically. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Everything was shook up. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. <laughs> when did help come for Paul and Silas? After they lifted up their eyes. This is when help came to my friend Tammy Trent. She and her husband... We're celebrating their 11th anniversary in Jamaica. Her husband, Trent Linderink, was a diver. He loved to dive. And not long before the end of their trip, he wanted to visit the Blue Lagoon. But he did not bring his diving equipment. Still, he could free dive. He could hold his breath for as long as five minutes. And so he told Tammy not to worry that he would be back soon. And he went to the Blue Lagoon. A few minutes passed and he didn't come back. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes passed, no signs of her husband. 30 minutes, 35, she began to worry. 40, 45 minutes, she called for help. Divers went to the Blue Lagoon and they began to search for her husband. They searched for three hours. 
They never found him. It got dark. They had to suspend the search. They resumed it the next morning, and that's when Tammy received a phone call. Her husband had drowned. She and her husband had been best of friends since high school, and now she was all alone in a foreign country. She called her parents. Immediately, her parents set about coming to see her. The next available flight was the next day. The next day just happened to be September 11th, 2001, the day terrorists attacked the United States. Everything shut down. Her parents get to, couldn't get to her, and Tammy could not leave Jamaica. She was alone in her hotel room. That's when she began to cry out to God. God, she prayed, if you are up there anywhere, please send somebody to help me, somebody to hold me, and let me know that you care and that you see me. A few short minutes after that prayer, there was a knock at her door. It was a housekeeper, an older Jamaican woman. I don't mean to bother you, she told Tammy, but I couldn't help but hear you crying. And I was trying to get to you. Could I just come in and hold you and pray for you? Tammy broke down in tears and she told the woman what had happened. And that kind Jamaican lady put her arm around Tammy and held her close and kept her company. Jesus used a Jamaican housekeeper to comfort an American daughter. Look to Jesus for your comfort. Lift up your eyes off of Jericho. I know you've been looking at this Jericho for a long time. I mean, you've counted the bricks in the wall. You know how many bricks have cracks. You know where the grass is growing. Your focus has been on this Jericho. Healing happens when we lift our eyes off the Jericho and set our eyes on our Heavenly Father. Look up. And then do something else. Joshua fell on his face, fell on his face to the earth and worshiped him. As you look up, take time to bow down. Joshua fell on his face. This is a five-star general. Two million people look up to him. 40,000 soldiers salute when he walks past. His tent is the equivalent of an oval office. And yet here's a man with a humility enough to fall on the ground on his face before God and worship. We are never so strong, never so mighty that we do not need to worship. It is in worship. It is in submitting ourselves and making ourselves low that God can lift us high. So lift up your eyes and look at him. Bow your knees before him in worship. Call out to your commander. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. This is God's promise to you. Receive it today. And when you call on your commander, you just keep your eyes open. Because who knows who's going to show up. Amen. And so, Lord, we receive this promise today. All of us are facing Jericho's to one degree or another. There's no one in here that is leading a challenge-free life. But, Lord, we all have you to turn to. Enough of this looking at Jericho. We're going to quit focusing on the problem, and we're going to start looking to you, our provider. Grant us, Father, fresh eyes to see you, fresh energy to pray, and, Lord, stir some hope where we have felt nothing but discouragement and despair. This is our prayer made through the name of Christ. And all who agreed with it said, Amen.